Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. Happy you Wednesday. Well. <laughs> yes. Happy Wednesday. Uh, welcome everyone to the seventh niche, niche conversation of season two. I'm Jessica DeWitt. I'm one of the editors here at the Network in Canadian History and Environment. And today I'm joined by Emma Mosswild. Do you want to tell us more about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Emma. I'm a PhD candidate in the history department at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm an environmental historian. I focus on the relationships between climate change and agricultural practice and rural life in um, the pre-1800 period. And I mostly focus mostly on, on the British Isles. Um, I also co-host the podcast Climate History. Yeah. Yes, and I, I'm an avid listener. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> you and Dagmar, that's good stuff. Uh, a suggestion for everyone to check that out. Um, so I was telling people before you arrived, we had a series this past, well, in September and October that we, Active History and also the Climate History Network, hosted on um, historians confronting the climate crisis. And your piece for this was uh, climate resilience, past and present, rural communities and food systems. So that's what we're talking about today is that, that piece. And I thought we would you know, start off by talking about your personal connection, which you touch upon a lot in the, in the post. Um, so what is your personal connection to rural communities and food systems? And how do you, how do you think that personal connection enriches your uh, research. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in Midcoast, Maine, um, here in the States. And uh, I grew up in a small town right on the coast, um, where farming and fishing are really integral parts of the local culture, really mm -hmm. important parts of um, the economy of the entire state. And it wasn't until I really got to college um, elsewhere in Maine that I realized um, how important growing up in that environment had been for me that, um, you know, before I was studying food systems and, and thinking about um, the local food movement, like I was eating local food. And, you know, yeah. we had, we had, we have friends who are farmers. Um, I spent summers like working um, in various kinds of agricultural um, projects. And, um, yeah, sort of getting that little bit of distance allowed me mm -hmm. to um, really think a little bit more critically about what that had meant um, for, uh, the, you know, the place where I grew up. Um, and the country that I grew up is, um, like I said, the county, excuse me, where I grew up is, is quite rural. And so studying rural, place just, rural places just makes a lot more sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, I can sort of, you know, I live in the city now and I love it, but um, when I think about, um, you know, thinking about change over time and how people respond to, ad respond to adverse circumstances, mm -hmm. I really do um, connect much more with stories uh, from places like where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, I always love hearing about people's personal connections to research because I too, like, I ended up state, studying state and provincial parks because I grew up outside of a state park and like, I had a very different, I have a very different understanding of parks than other people do because I see them as a place of work and a place of income for, for rural communities, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think of it as much as a place of leisure. So that always enriched the way that I look at parks and I always like to hear like how other people come, come to their research from different um, personal angles. And I feel like when I first started grad school, it was kind of frowned upon to like, talk about those personal connections because you're supposed to be you know you know objective and right um, yeah, yeah yeah and I feel like uh there's been a swing in the last decade or so since I started my MA um and that we're we're talking about these things more and I think that's really important yeah um, yeah absolutely yeah. especially thinking about like these landscapes of work that you're talking mm -hmm. about that I think mm -hmm. it sounds like for both of us like yep. moving beyond just, oh, this is a place where people come to visit. This is a place that looks really pretty in pictures mm -hmm. to there are people who live here all the time, people who yeah. have lived here for, um, for centuries. Um, and, 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 and I think that's, that's really important. And I'm glad that, mm -hmm. that those conversations are becoming more 
more prevalent. Yeah, I think that's so important. And to and to and to know that the that it's hard living. It's a hard living like to make. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, these people are like very resilient, as you're writing about. And um, so I wanted to talk a bit about you know the rural or urban duality and how do you see the climate crisis challenges. Uh, climate crisis challenges that uh, rural communities are facing or have faced in the past, um, how are they different or unique from those that urban populations have faced? Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I think this is such an important question because there are these really distinct, um, uh, you know, really distinct differences and in some cases disparities. I think mm -hmm. it's also important to acknowledge, of course, that the climate crisis affects everyone um, in really, really different ways and holding mm -hmm. space for both of those things being true, I think is is really important. And I, I'm glad that folks are starting to, to do that more, especially, you know, in, in media coverage and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, I think the the thing that, that stands out to me most with this question is the immediacy of, you know, extreme weather, um, a changing climate where I feel even now, I mean, um, the weather in D.C. has been unseasonably warm uh, this fall, but it doesn't really affect the way that I live my life day mm -hmm. to day here, although I do notice it. And of course, that's not true for everyone in an urban setting, whereas in a rural setting, um, I think the immediacy to what extreme weather means for your commute to work because public transportation infrastructure is minimal to non-existent in many rural mm -hmm. areas, what this means for, you know, already patchy internet access um, in, uh, you know, folks going to school during the pandemic and all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also for, for people who work outdoors or in, um, you know, any kind of what we might call like a natural resource area, whether that's farming, mm -hmm. um, forestry, fishing, anything like that, um, you know, being outside, doing that work, working with this crop for months, which is then, you know, in the space of a couple of days, the outcome of that crop can be completely transformed. And mm -hmm. I think that immediacy is something that is, you know, sometimes we hear about, it, you know, when um, there is massive flooding, for instance, in the Midwest and, and mm -hmm. whole crops are destroyed and homes are destroyed. But I think it, it shows up in a lot of really significant ways. Another important thing here is the seasonality of labor patterns and how just as climate as the climate changes today um the the seasonal rhythms of work which have been so um important in the particular um new england and maine ecosystem mm -hmm. are now changing right because um oceans are warming uh weather is becoming more variable and unpredictable and that means that labor systems and patterns have to change have to adapt because there's no mm -hmm. there's no other way when when these um these consequences are felt so immediately and this is also the case in the past right that um variable weather unpredictable weather um whether it's for you know, a year, a couple of years, or um, a longer climate anomaly of decades, this unpredictability is really where we start to see folks start to struggle. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can adapt to something if it's going to stay um, a new yeah. way. If, wet, if temperatures are just going to get warmer, it might be easier to adapt to that. But if one, one year you have a really extreme uh, cold snap and then the next year it's super wet and you really don't know what's going to happen next, then, you know, where, where do you go? Um, mm -hmm. how, do, how do you make a plan for how to move forward, not only for the next year, but the next five, the next 10, so on? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. And it's got my wheels turning as someone who grew up in a rural place and now I live in a city, I mean, small city in Canada, but um, just thinking of how, yeah, extreme weather just doesn't, you know, it gets a negative 50 here in Saskatoon in the winter, but like I can just like hop in an Uber and get, you know, to the door of where I need to go mm -hmm. or have food delivered to me if I need to. And, you know, there's all this infrastructure set up that kind of like, you know, assuages that, 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 yeah, immediacy. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just thinking about that and how that's always sort of been present and yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I thought we'd, we'd wrap up today by talking about your research, your specific research. Um, so what, what um, yeah, just talk a bit about your research went into um, how um, the long-term effects of extreme weather have affected uh, British agriculture. Yeah, yeah. So um, I arrived uh, at this project, which will form uh, the backbone of my dissertation in, in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, by, again, feeling this connection to rural stories and rural communities. Um, a lot of histories of agriculture and climate change focus, and I touched on this um, in the piece that was published a couple of months ago, um, a lot of it focuses on a pretty broad scale and uses a lot of what I think is pretty abstract information mm -hmm. um, to talk about, you know, climate change and agricultural, typically productivity rather than agricultural practice. And mm -hmm. this is the relationship between the two based on, you know, we know that um, average temperatures, for instance, declined. We know that uh, grain prices went up. We know that mm -hmm. there's a documented harvest failure or a food shortage. Um, people didn't have enough to eat. Uh, frequently social unrest ensues. This is a sort of like chain of, of causality that is, is discussed a lot when it comes to agriculture and climate change. And what I'm trying to do in my work is to move beyond that, what I think is of as abstract or uh, to, you know, move beyond these quantitative data to think about how folks in agricultural communities, which is, you know, a lot of the British Isles um, yeah. at this time, experienced what was really significant um, climate change from around 1500 to 1800 is the period that I look at the most, um, mm -hmm. a period of, of time called the Little Ice Age, um, which folks have probably heard of. It's a, it's yeah. a, 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 the place to be in climate <laughs> history in some ways, yeah. um, uh, a period of, you know, widespread climate change that took different forms in different parts of the world. But um, the, in the British Isles, it was colder on average, uh, significant storms, um, variable precipitation, um, often very dry. So my research tries to incorporate the paleoclimate sources, the sources um, that folks in the natural sciences mm -hmm. are able to utilize to reconstruct past climates. Um, such as tree rings um, or reconstructions of uh, atmospheric circulation. Yeah. Um, someone loves tree rings. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> the, um, and to combine those with the textual sources, which are more traditionally the purview of historians, many might, mm -hmm. might say. Um, and fortunately, there are tons of both of those kinds of sources for the British Isles. I really want to highlight that because the amount of climate reconstruction that's possible in the British Isles, um, the amount of data that are available is is just remarkable, um, mm -hmm. especially compared to other parts of the world. And, um, yeah. you know, the reasons why are far beyond the scope of this conversation. But um, <laughs> so to bring all of those different sources together and to think about smaller scales of change, um, mm -hmm. you know, by looking at particularly particular rural communities, for instance, um, the one of the projects that I'm working on, which I, I touched on in this piece, um, focuses on the county of Norfolk in uh, this particular anomaly in the 1740s when it was um, exceedingly cold. Mm -hmm. um, and so looking just there, for instance, we see that the the adaptations which are implemented immediately in response to these this unusually cold weather and this unusually dry weather in the 1740s then become integrated into broader agricultural changes which occur over the course of the 18th century. And so that to me is a much more interesting and a much more useful story mm -hmm. for thinking about why folks adapt to climate change and how, how that experience happens, who is making those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, the sort of work that I'm pursuing with my dissertation. Um, and again, with that, with that local focus, with those multidisciplinary sources, um, and then thinking about these multiple timescales of immediate adaptation as well as, as long-term adaptation. Ooh, that sounds so exciting. I love how, I love the interdisciplinarity of climate history, but also like sometimes it can get a little like, 
like all this data and it's hard to, to connect to you. So, you know, bringing that down and like figuring out how to make that, you know, into a story that's going to, you know, resonate with people and, you know, yeah, get the empathy going and stuff. And, you know, it's so important. And I guess that, that's what I love about environmental history period is that we can take these like broad sci scientific ideas and forces, et cetera, and like then bring it down to like the people and the animals. And yeah. um, anyways, it's all good stuff. And I'm so excited to see where it takes you and see where your career goes. And um, I'm already a big fan, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I uh, encourage everyone to check out this piece on our site or on Active History um, and to check out your podcast. And yeah, thank you so much for coming today, Emma, and speaking to me. Yeah, absolutely. This was so much fun. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.